marketing guy um, and he's just setting this. So I think, I think we've got uh, most people uh, join the call. So um, great to uh, be with you today. It's, uh, it's actually Holborn 6 Portugal Golden uh, Visa webinar this year. Um, we've got many attendees joining us uh, from UK, South Africa, I can see uh, Asia, including Hong Kong, uh, Singapore, and Malaysia. Um, so I can see we're up to a fair few people uh, joining us live, uh, which is great. Um, we will be uploading this uh, webinar to our website, the holbornassets.com uh, site, about 24 hours after this. So uh, you can view this again. Um, as we're an international wealth management company, we've published a lot of content, uh, a lot of blog posts, a lot of videos uh, on the Golden Vs. In fact, you can find them all on the Holborn website. Um, I was having a route around earlier today, um, and there's four webinars that we've done this year. Um, in January, we covered the, the changes to the uh, Portugal Golden Visa rules. Uh, so you can view that video online. Um, and in March, we held uh, two popular webinars of how to obtain a golden visa in nine months. Um, so feel free to check out the holborn.com uh, website. Um, but today we'll be focusing on a topic we've had many questions on, um, and that's the legal process and how to obtain a golden visa um, and the requirements. So our main speaker is Terzo Alolzabal, who is joining us from Lisbon. Um, Terzo is a partner at MDME law firm um, who have got offices uh, in Macau, Hong Kong uh, and Lisbon. Um, the format of today's webinar is really an opportunity for you guys to ask any questions you want on the process uh, to acquire a golden visa uh, for you and your family. Um, we probably should have around 45 minutes, so feel free to uh, send your questions on the chat and we'll come to them uh, in about 15-20 uh, minutes or so. Um, but what I'll do firstly, I'll just provide a brief overview on us um, and ultimately why the Golden Visa, um, a few points about the EU um, and then we'll hand over to uh, Terzo shortly. Um, but hopefully you've been all been uh, looking at the, uh, the the first slide that's on the screen, and that's a little bit of information about who Holborn are. Um, so we've now do, been doing this for about 24 years. We're a, a global uh, wealth management firm. Um, and we've got a lot of more inquiries from clients really in the last few years about the Golden Visa. So this is actually the, um, the biggest uh, division in the company now. Um, and as such, we counted right 10% of the global market for golden visas uh, last year. So definitely expanding. Um, I'm based in Hong Kong. Um, I serve clients all across Asia and the UK uh, and South Africa. Um, British by birth, um, as I say, 15 years in the business. Um, and ultimately, you know, why the EU, um, Portugal, after five years does give you full EU access. Um, and a reminder of, uh, of what that is, ultimately it's the opportunity to live, uh, to retire, uh, to work, uh, to study, and to open up a business in any of the 27 EU countries. Um, one thing we get asked about a lot is healthcare. And of course, if you're an EU citizen, uh, you have got access to the healthcare system across Europe. Um, but yeah, obviously today's about Portugal. Um, why Portugal? Um, well, well Terzo will, will focus a little bit about uh, that, but uh, Terzo is, is a good guy to, to, um, to talk about this. He's Portuguese himself. Um, but Portugal, I've been there a number of times and it is a very welcoming country to expats. Um, it is very pro-immigration. Um, and you know, not only does it have a good education system, uh, healthcare system, uh, it also has a very unique tax system, which is particularly attractive for applicants for the Golden Visa. Um, so I don't want to steal Terzo's thunder there, so he'll uh, cover that uh, in a little bit. Um, but what is the Golden Visa? Um, 
effectively for the first five years, it gives you the uh, right to live, uh, to work uh, in Portugal. Um, and it has the 10 years non-habitual tax regime, which again, we'll, we'll cover off uh, in a little bit more detail. Um, but let's hand over to Terzo. Um, he is the lawyer. Uh, that's what this uh, webinar is about. So um, Terzo, thank you. So thank you very much, Chris. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to this webinar today. So, um, uh, and like Chris, I'm, I'm in Lisbon at the moment, but normally I'm based in, uh, in Hong Kong as well. Um, so just briefly, my name is Tirso Lazaval. I'm a partner at MDME Law Firm. So as Chris said, we, we are present in uh, Lisbon, Hong Kong and Macau. Uh, we are a full service law firm but we have a private client department which includes the, the golden visa and I'm the head of such department uh, so I've been working with the golden visa for quite some time now uh, since pretty much its creation uh, in 2013 it was created in late 2012 but it started in uh, more actively in 2013 and uh, the main investors at that time were uh, Chinese investors so uh, it was uh, um, uh, our, our strategic presence in Asia made us very experienced on this since the very beginning. Um, this is, I think you are looking at my profile now. Um, well, uh, I've been working with, uh, with the Golden Visa and with our team uh, for a very long time. Uh, we have now uh, are working presently with uh, pretty much uh, a, a very large amount of jurisdictions, investors from all, all over the world, so South Africa, uh, US, uh, UK now, that since they, they exit uh, uh, the, the EU, and of course, uh, very active in Asia still. Um, so that's it. Thank you very much. My, my, uh, maybe we can change the slide now. Uh, so I'm going to just to, to brief you on the on the main features of the golden visa. Not going to take much of, of, of your time here because I'm, I, I, I suppose that most of you already did some homework on this. So the Portuguese golden visa is a, a program is a visa on investment program, which means that if you do an eligible investment, you are eligible to uh, apply for a golden visa. Uh, a golden visa is a temporary residence permit that allows you to live and work in Portugal and freely travel within the Schengen area. Um, the, the, and like the other programs, and I would say that this is that what, what made the Golden Visa very successful, is that you only have a minimum period of stay of seven days every year, uh, which when compared to other programs is very minimal uh, and gives a lot of flexibility to the investors. It also allows investors to do family reunification, so to bring to the application wife, husband, children, and parents as well of the, of the main investor under, cert, under certain requirements. Um, and that's, uh, that's basically the, the main features of the golden visa. Uh, and after five years, you are then entitled to apply for permanent residency or Portuguese citizenship under certain requirements. Um, I would now pass to the to the next slide, which is basically what are those investments that will lead uh, to um, the golden visa. So uh, I'm just going to focus on the main investments. There are other investments, but uh, those investments have never been used before, which are pretty much seen as donations. Um, so the main investments are usually property investments. So real estate investment of at least a ticket of 500,000 euros in any type of property in Portugal. For the main cities now of Portugal since this year, and if you have followed the last webinar that uh, uh, Chris uh, did on the changes of the Golden Visa Law since January, you are no longer able to invest in residential property in Lisbon and Porto and in some coastal areas of Portugal. But you are still able to invest in commercial, touristic and service properties, as well as shops. 
um, in relation to residential property. You can do it in other areas of Portugal, as well as the islands of Madeira and Azores. The same is applicable to the ticket of investment in a property of 350,000 euros. What's the difference between the two? It's that the 350,000 euros involves rehabilitation works in the property and that you are buying a property that is either located in an urban regeneration zone or the property has more than 30 years old. So the investment on the property plus the rehabilitation works, 350,000 euros. It means that if you buy a property for 200,000 euros, a property, let's say, with more than 30 uh, years old, uh, you will need to do rehabilitation works. So have a, um, a works agreement in the amount of 150,000 euros. Uh, and the same restrictions that apply uh, on the type of property are also applicable uh, here on the 350,000 euros. So next slide, please. Um, the other uh, type of investment that is very popular is the capital transfer. So the capital transfer uh, means an investment in a private equity fund that is registered in Portugal that has more than five years of maturity since the, the moment of subscription and that invests at least 60% of its funds in Portugal. The minimum ticket for this investment is 500,000 euros. The other type of investment that uh, investors, uh, it's not that that frequent but is also used so i have uh, opted to put it here as well is simply the transfer of funds into a portuguese bank account and this one has a minimum ticket of one million and five hundred thousand euros i think that's it in terms of the general overview on the golden visa and um, I think the idea of this webinar, uh, Chris, was to do an active uh, Q&A session. So I'm here to, to answer the questions that uh, you might want to ask. Indeed, thank you, Terzo. And uh, as a reminder, just uh, submit your questions through the chat and we'll work our way through those. Uh, any that we can't answer uh, directly today, uh, we can take offline um, and we can uh, cover those personally. Um, but I can see we've got some questions so far. Um, so um, the first is how long does the process take? So the process, the process takes, uh, well, I, I would say that uh, the process starts with uh, uh, collecting some personal documents of the clients, uh, uh, opening the bank account that the clients need to have, they must have in Portugal because the money of the investment needs to sit in that bank account. Um, and uh, obtaining the tax number of the client, as well as choosing the investment. This normally takes around uh, one month and a half. Okay, uh, we are able just to give you an, an idea to open a bank account in um, uh, ten days. Okay, so uh, uh, once this is done and everything is done, it can take. It, it also depends if the client uh, takes. Uh, time to choose its investment or not okay but i would say that typical typically one month to one month and a half to complete this first part that will take us to have everything in order to make the online submission once you make the online submission of the application it normally takes three to four months to obtain the acceptance of that uh, uh, submission the application after that, you are in a position to book your biometrics meeting with the immigration department in Portugal. Um, after you come and do your meeting with the immigration department, it takes at least three months for the visa to be issued. So we are talking about nine months, uh, the, the whole process to obtain the golden visa. I have to say, and Chris, this is just a practical remark that at the moment, uh, this is taking uh, nine months and probably a little bit more time due to two main reasons. Portugal was under lockdown last year, uh, so the immigration department was uh, closed for a big part of the year. And then we have now the war in Ukraine and Portugal is giving uh, priority to receiving refugees for, from Ukraine that want to run away from the country. So the immigration department in Portugal 
is very active on this, on helping those people. So it might affect a little bit uh, these timings, and this is just an estimation. Interesting. And, and Terza, how long do you think it would take to kind of clear the backlog? Um, would be any indication there? Well, um, uh, the backlog uh, is expected to be clear in the in the coming months, okay, um, due to these main reasons, okay, uh, that also was creating, created by the change of law in January. So we had a lot of things uh, going on, uh, unexpected things and other expected things that uh, have created this this uh, this backlog. But uh, we hope that in the coming uh, months everything will be back to normal. Uh, Chris, I think you are muted. Sorry. Sorry, right. should be slicker these days. <laughs> um, we have a question from Edward here. Quite an interesting uh, question. Um, yeah. That. Is there any restrictions for politically exposed persons uh, for Africans? Also, can sanctioned countries such as in Zimbabwe invest in the golden visa? Okay, there are certain uh, uh, certain restrictions on uh, on um, on countries. Okay, so at the moment, for example, uh, Portugal is not allowing submissions coming from Russia and Iran. Okay. Uh, in terms of uh, exposed uh, people, uh, there is no restrictions per se, but there is some discretionary on the immigration department at the time they make the uh, meeting with the client uh, to uh, vet that person and to see whether it represents any danger to the country itself or not. Yeah, all uh, you know, worthwhile, well-intentioned um, rules yeah. there, so understood. Um, now, you, you mentioned about the process in terms of the um, opening bank account is, is fairly quickly. Um, uh, obviously, there's a language test here. You know, Portugal wants people to integrate into the community and speak the language. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about that requirement, uh, what level of Portuguese and, um, yeah, how that's tested? Okay. So uh, we are talking about uh, the technical name of the test is a CAPLE, uh, C-A-P-L-E, uh, Portuguese test, um, which can be uh, taken, doesn't necessarily need to be taken in Portugal, it can be taken in any institute of language, uh, Portuguese institute of language that is recognized around the world. Um, so for example, from people from Hong Kong, they have it in Macau, and they have it, other people around the, the world might have it as well. Um, so this is an A1 uh, level Portuguese exam. Uh, and uh, I would say that the exam in terms of difficulty is an elementary Portuguese uh, test, which requires someone to have basic knowledge of Portuguese, which means, I would say, uh, a, a very simple conversation, like uh, um, when someone says that they don't really know how to speak the language, but they can speak with the taxi driver. So uh, I would say that that is the the the, the level of uh, of the of the Portuguese test. Of course, uh, for me, it's very easy. It's uh, very unfair to tell you that it's very very easy. It, it will depend uh, on a, on a case by case basis. But I have to say also that this is um, um, a personal remark and um, that happened to us because we have we do have uh, Chinese lawyers uh, that uh, are Portuguese speakers and uh, uh, they took the Portuguese degree in the university in Portugal. So it's a, it's a very technical degree, it's a law degree, and they didn't know how to speak a word of Portuguese. They came to Portugal one year before the university started. They learned that in, in one year, and they, they took the five years law degree, which is quite impressive. So I think that someone that uh, want to make the effort, it's not that impossible. Uh, it's not impossible at all. So it's... Uh, Interesting, yes. And there's many apps these days you can learn languages mm -hmm. such as uh, Duolingo, which gamifies uh, learning languages through uh, images, rewards, etc. Um, but just a, another question on, on language, um, to, so 
In your experience, what percentage of people fail the test and how many chances do you get to retake it? Well, you, you can retake it as many times as, as you want, okay? So uh, there's, no, there's no restrictions on that. Um, so the, the, the percentage really depends uh, on... Uh, it's difficult to say because some people redo the test and then they pass it eventually, okay? So um, it's... Uh, Keep trying. Yeah. yeah. Persistency pays. Exactly. Okay. Um, now, we mentioned before about the NHR tax regime. So we have mm -hmm. a lot of attendees online who are based in Singapore and Hong Kong. Um, and in those two places, you know, residents are lucky enough to be taxed at very low rates uh, on both uh, income uh, and um, not taxed on investments. Whereas I'm British, um, you know, I, I used to pay very high rates of tax. And reality is Europe is significantly higher in terms of uh, taxation, both on investments, property income, uh, etc. Um, can you give us a little bit of explanation of what the non-habitual tax regime is uh, and the the ten-year rule and how that works, please, Terzo? Okay. Um, so I think it's very important for people to 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 know and to make the difference between uh, two things: uh, the fact that you are applying for a golden visa does not turn you into a tax resident in Portugal, okay? So applying for a golden visa is independent of being a tax resident. Uh, you uh, can or not become a tax resident. Uh, how does it happen? Uh, when someone that moves to Portugal and lives in Portugal for a period over than 183 days per year, and declares that its primary residence is in Portugal, then they become a tax resident in Portugal. For those who want to do that, and in the previous five years have not been a tax resident in Portugal, they can apply for the NHR. The NHR is a more favorable taxation regime, okay, that uh, will entitle that person to be taxed at a flat tax rate of 20% for a period of 10 years um, in certain uh, activities, okay? There are some professions that are excluded from these, such as, in my case, a uh, lawyer, uh, but uh, uh, this is something that someone that holds a golden visa and wants to move to Portugal and wants to be a tax resident in Portugal, they can apply and be taxed at a more at a more favorable tax rate. If you apply to the golden visa and you don't plan to move to Portugal, you want to keep on living in South Africa, wherever you are, uh, then uh, you are not a tax resident in Portugal, so you will only pay taxes on the income that you effectively generate in Portugal. The income that you generate outside Portugal will be taxed according to your jurisdiction. Okay, um, so that's uh, uh, very briefly uh, how it works. Uh, the difference between uh, being or not being a tax resident, uh, of course. Uh, this uh, um, we can go in, into more detail, of course, and we do have a, a tax capability to explain into further detail this, but I don't want to go and to mix up people to be more general because then each person is a case. So we can talk into more detail if there's any interest on in knowing more about this. Fantastic. And just a, a question here from Mark on the NHR. Regime. You mentioned professions that are uh, excluded from that or ha have uh, different rules. Could you just elaborate on broadly what those uh, professions are, please, Terzo? Well, there is a, there is a list of, uh, um, of activities uh, that is foreseen in the law that are eligible for the, golden, for the, the NHR. Um, we do have also a paper uh, written on this and I might send to the to the participants if uh, they like, because the list is quite extensive, and uh, we are talking about engineers, architects, uh, 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 a very broad range of uh, uh, professionals and activities. Okay, directors of companies. 
So then you can structure it in a way that you are under this regime, even if maybe your activity or what you do, your professional activity is not included there. So uh, it might be easier for me to uh, send that, that paper that includes all that, uh, all that uh, activity list, professional activity list. Understood. So Mark, who asked that question, yeah, feel free to uh, contact me direct. We can yep. liaise uh, more closely on that. Um, we, we're getting a few questions here about parents and family members. Mm -hmm. um, could you, Terzo, just explain what the rules are, both two ways, getting parents on applications, but also uh, the age limits on getting your children on the application as well, okay. please. Okay, so uh, as I uh, briefly uh, referred in, uh, in the beginning, uh, the Golden Visa gives you the possibility of uh, doing a family reunification, which means that you can bring into your application, into the main investor application, your children, uh, and then the wife, husband, and even the parents of the main applicant. So this moves from, uh, let's say, uh, above to from up, to down, but doesn't move from right to left. So brothers and sisters, it's not possible to, to bring and to do the family reunification. Um, in terms of uh, children, the children uh, normally, if they are under age, which means under 18 years old, uh, according to Portuguese law, uh, you don't really need to uh, make any special, um, uh, you don't really need to, to show any special uh, requirements uh, except the birth certificate that you are the parent of that children. Um, if the children are over age, is it, it is also possible to bring it into the application, but you need to fulfill two extra requirements. So if your children is over 18 years old, he must be single and he must be financially dependent of the parents, which means, and it is seen as that he is still studying. So you need to show and make evidence that he is enrolled in a university or some sort of uh, uh, studies. In relation to the parents, uh, it is also possible to bring your parents in the application. You need to show that your parents are financially dependent on you. What does it mean? This is a question of evidence. It means that if you make regular payments or transfers to your parents, if your parents live with you, uh, if you some sort of do some uh, uh, regular payments to them or you pay them uh, uh, some expenses that they have, uh, this we will need to show uh, in order to bring them into your application. If your parents are over 65 years old, uh, and because 65 years old is the age where people are considered to be retired in Portugal, you don't really need to show any financial uh, evidence that they uh, are financially dependent on you, okay? This is pretty much uh, the idea of the family reunification. Okay, fantastic. And so presumably, if the uh, the son or daughter gets married within the five-year period, would that be an issue? And that will be an issue because on the renewals, uh, on the second and fourth year, uh, we will always need to show, and this is one document that needs to, to be submitted uh, when we start their application, that uh, a certificate of non-marriage, so to, to make sure that they are not married. At that point, if they are married, they might not be able to get that certificate, so they will no longer be able to be under that application. It is, uh, uh, well, uh, highly advisable that if the kids are planning to marry or they are indeed going to start to work and they are not uh, financially, let's say, or dependent on the parents, they, that they take an application by themselves. Understood. Okay, thanks. And we've got a message, uh, a, a question from Mark here, just going back to one of your previous uh, slides mm -hmm. here, Terzo. Um, uh, what constitutes touristic property and list of permissible uh, investments? 
Um, okay. So there's a classification of, um, I think it was the previous one here. Um, yeah. yeah, and so, different price brackets. So, so touristic uh, properties are uh, in Portugal properties that uh, are uh, that have a license from the tourism department okay uh, so they are proper licenses that are not seen as residential per se but are uh, close to what is a hotel in between a hotel and uh, uh, an airbnb uh, so these are specific properties okay uh, that are you 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 are having those properties and projects uh, you have more and more projects in portugal especially in lisbon that uh, are being done uh, and envisaged to become touristic properties so properties that will have a license from the tourism department to um, receive uh, uh, people and to lodge them. Normally a tourism property has, let's say a reception uh, where you have someone, a concierge, and then you uh, provide assistance to those properties. Uh, you don't really need to have specific facilities, but this is a specific license from the tourism department. And uh, we will immediately know if those properties are tourism properties or not because they have this license. Okay. So this is what we in Portugal call touristic properties. Okay. Fantastic. Um, now, you mentioned before the Golden Visa rules are now in the 10th year. They came out in uh, 2012. There's been some rather big changes that were implemented this year, January the 1st, whereby uh, Lisbon, Porto, uh, and the coastal areas were taken off the eligibility uh, list. Um, there's two questions here from, from John. Um, if the golden visa rules changed or stopped in the future, um, would, would I lose the right uh, to apply for my golden visa? Um, uh, and secondly, there's another question in terms of how long will this opportunity exist for? Uh, do you get a sort of inkling on, on, on both those questions, please, to say? Okay, so um, if there is any change whatsoever, normally the principle of law in Portugal is that laws uh, are uh, and will apply for the future. So they don't apply for past, uh, um, past cases. So uh, this means that if your application has been accepted, uh, any change will not apply to you and you will be still be under the, uh, the, the regime that was enforced when you uh, did your application. So there is no risk whatsoever. And to give you a practical example, I did hundreds of applications uh, last year and in December uh, um, that were submitted last year. Um, and the rule that was in the law, there was an article in the law that made the amendment for this year that said all the applications that have been submitted before the end of the year will still be under the old regime. So not even accepted, submitted. So those applications, and some of them uh, uh, um, have just been accepted, are still under the old regime, although now we have new rules. So uh, the law normally and changes, they will have effects for the future and not for past occasions. Um, your second question was, sorry, uh, Chris. The second question is um, linking this in with another question Edwards just, just put in here, it is how long do you think this golden visa um, rule will exist for? Obviously the EU are putting a little bit of pressure mm -hmm. uh, or there's been headlines in the press and I believe mm -hmm. uh, there's certain countries uh, that have taken, I think Cyprus had their golden visa uh, policy um, or they removed it. Mm -hmm. And so how long do you think this would be available for in the future? Uh, and I guess as well, that does probably link with politics um, mm -hmm. because it's perhaps a, a government decision. So could you could just expand on that? Well, it's true that the European Commission has been uh, raising uh, issues on this type of programs, um, which is um, uh, normally related to issues on of AML issues uh, that uh, have been uh, created through uh, this kind of programs. That's why 
uh, and I and I referred on your very first question that the immigration department has uh, the last discretionary vetting to see whether the people represents any risk whatsoever on that. Um, so um, there is and there has been some pressure from the EU to uh, eventually uh, stop with this uh, type of programs. Um, the fact is that there is no uh, formal decision on that until now, and uh, uh, this is something that will then have to be uh, enacted by the countries themselves and by the local governments. Um, Portugal uh, has a lot uh, and, uh, and uh, relies a lot on the golden visa, so um, in terms of the government itself, and the government that has just been re-elected in uh, January in Portugal is uh, uh, um, uh, in favor of uh, the golden visa and they have been supporting the golden visa uh, since the very beginning. So in terms of local government, we would not see uh, any, or it's not foreseeable that any changes would be made. Uh, but it's true that there is this pressure from the EU and at some point, uh, um, this will be a reality and uh, I'm sure that uh, that might happen. I heard and I've been reading, of course, very carefully uh, the news that come from, from the EU and that is uh, uh, been said that it might happen uh, by 2025. Uh, and then, of course, countries will have a period of time to uh, incorporate those directives that come from EU because the European Union has a specific legislation so uh, they, they, they have directives that are uh, enacted and then each country has a period of time to implement those directives so this uh, is a stage by stage uh, implementation um, this is what I can say and what I know uh, and uh, and uh, but but for the time being and for the for the next few years, I don't expect um, any change on the golden visa process. Um, it is just my personal opinion. Okay, uh, I don't uh, I don't have uh, I, I'm not sure if it will or will not happen shortly or uh, in the future or further down the road. Yeah, and I guess given what you said there about yeah a new government. Uh, just in place, they're in favor of it. Uh, yes, there might be you know three, five years left on this, mm -hmm. but then it's down to Portugal to implement that EU policy. Mm -hmm. I guess given that you know Portugal has, has raised you know five billion euros plus through foreign direct mm -hmm. investment into Portugal, there's a huge incentive for Portugal to keep this for the time being. There is, there is. So, uh, of course, as I, as I said, Portugal relies and one of the main drivers of the economy is tourism. So, uh, and this is, uh, uh, tourism relies a lot on foreign investment and this has helped a lot to regenerate the city and uh, even for people to discover this beautiful country that has then led to other investments that are not related to Golden Visa, but direct investments on real estate and from even European countries such as France, that they are very implemented now in Portugal, uh, Italy. So uh, that, uh, that is something that, uh, of course, has been helping a lot the country and we rely a lot and it's seen with good eyes by the government. Yeah, okay. Uh, we've got an interesting question that I'll answer this as my you know, background is financial advice and financial planning. Um, Tom has asked a very interesting question of, for the transfer of a fund, um, uh, 1.5 million, does it imply deposit into a bank? Uh, what is the annual interest rate? So yes, you can put cash in the bank. Um, in these very uh, low interest rate environments, uh, there's two issues with that. Um, one, inflation is running at, what, 6 7% a year. So for every million pound you hold in a bank account, there's a cost to you, and that's a loss of money of 60,000 pound a year. Um, so in the case of 1.5 million, it would be probably costing you 90,000 pound a year, given that the banks give no interest. Um, so yeah, in this environment, uh, it would be a terrible decision to keep 
uh, 1.5 million uh, in the bank, uh, particularly the five years. And that's really why we prefer real estate. Um, and in the, in the last few minutes, we'll just cover on our product offering, whereby we do have um, uh, investment properties that qualify for the golden visa that do generate an income. Uh, and these can pay up to 5% a year uh, rental income. So yeah, they provide income, which can be used for retirement, uh, it can be used for you know, application fees, uh, and they can be, you know, the income can be provided for, for, you know, for, for settling in, in Portugal. Uh, so thanks, Tom, for that question. Um, we've got probably about five, 10 minutes left. So we've probably got room for two, three more questions. Um, there's a couple of questions on businesses here. Um, one from Mark, uh, and the question is, as a golden visa recipient, how simple it is, is it to set up a small business in Portugal? Um, and there's another question um, here, uh, I believe, a similar thing. Um, what is the requirements if creating a business in Portugal to qualify for? So two very similar questions. So uh, yeah, opening a business in uh, in Portugal with a golden visa? Well, um, I, I have to say that there are no restrictions at, at all in terms of, uh, of opening businesses in Portugal, generally speaking. So uh, it means that being or not being a golden visa, uh, Portugal normally welcomes people to open business uh, in Portugal. Uh, so uh, this means that uh, the company set up is generally a very fast and straightforward in Portugal. Uh, and uh, uh, there are no restrictions in terms of shareholding or directorship. Um, so I would say that it's pretty much simple. I would say that the most difficult thing would be to find the right business. But um, it's uh, pretty much um, something straightforward and simple. And that is not costly, I would say. I believe so, so there's a requirement for employing people in a minimum salary. Is that right? I guess so. You, uh, um, I, I thought that was uh, being a, a golden visa uh, and okay. a, 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 a real estate, let's say, uh, investment, and then you want to open a business. Yes, there is uh, for the for the golden visa through the setting up of uh, a company in Portugal. There is a minimum requirement of uh, employing ten workers in Portugal. Okay, and is there a minimum salary attached to those 10 workers? There is a minimum salary uh, that is very low in Portugal, which is uh, now around 700 uh, euros. Okay, so that's going to be, yeah, uh, 700 euros per employee uh, per month yeah. uh, times 12. Yeah, 84,000. And then you will need to pay as well social security, uh, which will be for someone that uh, earns 700 euros around uh, 120 euros uh, per month. And probably you might need also to have an insurance for those workers. So there are some requirements there behind the scenes, okay, uh, that we can go into further detail if there is any real interest on doing the golden visa through this uh, type of investment. Fantastic. And uh, John uh, asks here, is there a minimum amount of revenue per annum? And I don't believe there's a minimum amount no, of revenue no, no. to employees. There is no. Yeah. There is no. Okay. Um, so I think just kind of rounding it up here, um, one uh, question that we do often come across um, is mortgages. And obviously, yeah, most places in the world, you can buy property with mortgages. Um, how does that work in, in uh, Portugal for golden visa applicants, Terzo? So uh, um, it is possible to create a mortgage uh, over the property. However, that mortgage uh, um, has to be on the exceeding amount of the minimum investment amount. So if you buy a property of, let's say, 1 million euros, you can only take a mortgage that covers 500,000 euros. The other 500,000 euros or, or 350,000, depending on the type of investment, uh, needs to be clean from any charges. Yeah. 
So ultimately, that there's a minimum cash requirement. You can top that up with a mortgage. Exactly. Uh, that's yeah, yeah. But from from my experience, uh, you know, all of the the clients that we've brought over the line with the Golden Visa buy with cash, uh, and I advise them mm -hmm. yeah, correct, the correct. easiest way of, of correct. applying. Correct. Um, because then then you need to apply also for the mortgage with the Portuguese banks, and uh, there are some requirements that you need to pass as well. So uh, normally it's a cash investment. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and Tong asks, uh, is there inheritance tax in Portugal in case uh, the applicant or the holder of that property passes away? No, there is no, no inher inheritance tax. Good, unlike the UK, which is uh, pretty brutal. At, I know, uh, I know. 45%. <laughs> 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 um, fantastic. Um, so, Terzo, really appreciate um, all the questions that you've uh, you. expertly uh, answered there. And um, sorry, there's a few questions we haven't had time for, but feel free to email me those mm -hmm. uh, and we can answer them directly. Um, what I want to do just f uh, as a final uh, two minutes is just explain our latest uh, offering uh, for uh, our exclusive property to Holborn clients. Um, now this is our fifth uh, uh, Golden Visa property we've had in the last 18 months. Um, and as I mentioned at the outset, we've helped uh, over 150 clients last year uh, through the Golden Visa process. Uh, this year, uh, I think we're kind of probably way beyond that. Uh, we will be uh, by the end of the year. Um, but this is an example uh, of a, a project that meets the criteria that Terzo explained. Um, it's a Golden Visa eligible uh, property in the Algarve. Um, and it's a hotel that comes under the 30-year-old um, refurbished uh, property rule. Um, so there's no um, issue of um, off-plan risk here. It's a property that is built. Uh, it's functioning. You can look it up on uh, booking.com uh, and you'll find it gets uh, really good reviews. Um, the three things that make this compelling uh, as an investment and also as a um, a vehicle to uh, apply the golden visa. Uh, first of all, it's location. Um, it's in uh, Alvor, which is uh, a town uh, on the south coast of Portugal. Um, and this is the key tourist area. We always look for properties that have uh, both drivers for income uh, and capital appreciation. Um, most of these hotels on the south coast and Algarve be booked up throughout the, the peak summer season. Um, and this is the prime area where a lot of northern pale white skinned Europeans like me uh, take our annual summer holiday. Um, so the first thing is there's demand for this property because of the location. Um, it's also obviously next to golf courses, uh, yeah, the small of the town. Uh, it's near the F1 track uh, outside Portimao. Um, uh, and there's things to do here for families. You know, it's very much a family friendly area, the Algarve. Um, the second thing that makes it compelling is it's a title deed. So this means that you own that property in your name. Um, you purchase it in cash. Uh, once the transaction goes through, you get a certificate showing that you own that property. And that means it is eligible for the Golden Visa. And that's the jigsaw puzzle that allows us uh, and the law firm to put through uh, your Golden Visa application, proving that you're an owner of a Portuguese property. And um, the third thing that makes this compelling is the yield that this produces. Um, the yield in most places around the world for property these days, you're lucky if you get 3%. Um, here, we can guarantee to clients a yield, an annual income of between 4 and 5.2% net of tax, um, which is particularly compelling in this low interest rate environment. And because you have that title deed, meaning you own the property directly, um, you can benefit from future capital appreciation uh, as well. Um, the fourth thing that we like about this, and I believe we are unique in the market, um, is the exit strategy. Um, because after all, on year six, you will have that Portuguese passport in your hand. You'll have been through the five-year golden visa process. Um, 
And at that point, you don't necessarily need to continue with this property. It served its purpose. So on year six, uh, there's a guaranteed buyback from the developer, meaning they will buy the property back from you uh, for the price you bought it. So offering a very clean exit strategy. And in that time, you'll obviously have benefited from the 5.2% income uh, the property's produced. Uh, or the alternative route is you can sell on the open market yourself. And as I say, enjoy that appreciation. Um, the Portuguese property market has been particularly buoyant uh, over the last 12 months. Uh, I was just speaking uh, with someone in, um, uh, in uh, outside Portimao on the call before this, and he told me the property prices have gone up by 25% in his area. Um, the figures that we have are around about 11% growth, but uh, you know, I think on average, uh, you know, if we say 3-4% uh, appreciation is, is, you know, is a realistic figure over the last 5-10 years. Um, so more details can be um, uh, obtained on this by yeah, uh, asking myself directly. Um, as a reminder, um, we'll make the webinar available on the holbornassets.com website tomorrow. Um, we'll also be able to send a link out uh, to this to anyone, uh, your friends or colleagues that couldn't join tonight. Um, and then finally, um, yeah, thanks very much to Terzo. Um, feel free to ask any other questions uh, that we uh, haven't been able to get around to answering today. Uh, and we'll forward those to Terzo. Um, but once again, yeah, thanks for uh, joining us today. And I um, hope you can uh, join us uh, on the next one uh, or engage in our content online. Thank you very much, Chris, and thank you very much to the audience as well for taking your time to, to be here today and to listen to, to our webinar. Thank you very much. Thanks once again.